This is a message to all my supporters of this podcast. I'm introducing a new supporters program. You can contribute a small amount as a one-off payment to show your love for this podcast. Thank you in advance for all your contributions. There we go, a couple minutes early. I cannot hear you. You might be muted. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I cannot hear you. I have audio on my laptop, though. I can hear you. Cannot hear you. Cannot hear you. We are recording. I have other audio. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Hayward. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast. Today, I've got Andrew Lee Miller, who's also known as Andrew Startups, as you can see from the the T-shirt. And we're going to talk about startups. We're going to talk about marketing. And we're going to go into some details about about the different consultancy business and and areas that he works in. So Mm -hmm. so just to start straight away, Andrew, thank you for joining me here. Um, And what I wanted to start was maybe a little bit left field about your degree and your 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 education um mm-hmm. you did a business admin with international focus so 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 what what inspired you to do the the, the business focus a lot of people do the business admin but don't do the international side yeah that's a good point and i started in college as a general business degree you know like in america i think it's just the thing to do is to go to college and actually I'm fourth generation entrepreneur on both sides. I had a business in high school detailing automobiles for people. So I never really wanted to go to college, but you know, I think my family gave into the pressure and they were like, no, you're going to college. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll get a general business degree. And then when I was there, I started meeting international students and really realizing that I have ability, I have talent and ability for language and a real love of culture. And then I started to realize that, even though America might be a world power or was or whatever, um, there is no such thing as business if you are not in international business. So even as a small business, you're having a website now and you're selling overseas and you're promoting yourself or you're well, you're getting blog visitors from overseas. So I was just, uh, you know, even back then thinking that international business is the way to go. So I switched that way. And, um, you know, it's funny you ask about education because I don't really feel like I use much that I learned in college for my actual business. It's all startups. The education is working in tech and working with these companies over and over again in these stressful situations when they need to grow and they need to, they need to scale and they need to partner and they need to grow without spending money. Um, We don't really look at education that much. Like it's a tick box. You want someone that has a degree, but even now Google and Facebook both don't look at, and Apple don't look at uh, college degrees anymore as a necessity. Yeah. But for me, I feel like I grew a lot as a per- person. And, you know, my mindset grew from just my small little business to like, oh, now I can have clients all over the world and travel and stuff. So so globalization obviously uh, was was a key factor in, in sort of your uh the way you, you, you saw the world. And this is, that's actually still even now quite unusual for a lot mm-hmm. of businesses in the in the US, because I, I would guess, because even in the UK, we uh, which is where I'm based, they, they there's still a lot of national businesses which never looks towards the global side. Did you did you see for you that you wanted to work at that time like larger corporations? Because I, I would imagine with an international focus, you wouldn't necessarily go to startups. You'd probably go to big corporations. So what what drove you to to work with startups and the passion for startups which you have? Yeah, I think one thing is the entrepreneurialism that's in my blood. 
Um, but two, you know, I think life is about testing and seeing what you respond best at. Yeah. And for me, I think the, go the goal for me in everything, personal life, professional life, is to just inject myself where I can create the most value. Yeah. And when you're passionate about something, it's much easier to work hard and be better uh, than anybody else at your, at your skill. If, you're, if you do what you love then you, for work, then you never really work a day. And I found out that I loved and was very talented at this early stage startup growth hacking. Um, <clears throat> I do consult sometimes with corporations nowadays yeah. after 15 years of successes, but it's consulting from a startup point of view on how they can act more efficiently, how they can be more nimble, how they can do low budget marketing, how they can launch test projects as startups internally. So my whole world is all about startups and there's a lot of people who have come after me saying the same thing, but I eat, breathe, and sleep early stage startup, which yeah. is the least financially successful uh, the, that the company will ever be. So it's um, not a focus if you're only caring about the money. If you only care about the money, then you'll be a corporate consultant and you'll charge hundreds of thousands of dollars. But for me, it's the passion um, project. Uh, around with the early stage like so coming up with the initial branding coming up launching the initial marketing campaigns testing channels testing value propositions testing different product market fits <clears throat> a lot of people struggle in those stressful scenarios and that's what i like and so that's why i gravitate towards that and um so you say that knowledge and sort of experience is is key in this sort of area um so your first your first uh startup that you did was an online advertising in Mexico so um, initially so you, you had an entrepreneurial spirit and you wanted to leverage that um, but why Mexico why initially Mexico to be honest successful in life is leaving yourself open to amazing opportunities that might come in and being able to be in fluid like water as Bruce Lee would say but um, an opportunity came to move to Mexico um, not for the job. I had I had a startup of my own in college, and I had an opportunity to live in Mexico and continue my um, language practice. I was learning Spanish, which I'm now fluent in because of that decision. Um, so the opportunity to move to Mexico and further continue my language courses, but through immersion, um, was there. And so I moved there, and then I found the, the, the tourism startup in Mexico, and that's when I really fell into um, marketing for startups. I had already done it for my own, but as an entrepreneur, it's different. When you're wholly focused on the growth and marketing, then yeah. like I said, you eat, sleep, and breathe that those those metrics and those, those that one um, focus. And uh, yeah, so I was there for a year and I got the that business to an ROI positive plateau where I was almost not necessary anymore like so machines are running in the business to drive more business and they've hit a point operationally that they can that they're maxed out so they don't want any more marketing yeah. and uh that doesn't work for a guy like me like getting bored and paid for sitting at home yeah, yeah. sounds like a dream to most people oh uh, to i totally understand i can so totally empathize with you i i'm lit i'm moving my roles and um i'm moving to a different company and uh i've, I've had to do a three month notice period and yeah. so um i'm now in the third month where i start my new job at the end of may and i must admit like uh, people were saying to me oh you're so lucky you've got a couple of months where you're not doing very much it must be so nice to relax I'm like, i really don't like it i really well, don't like that a couple of months. I mean, if if you, do you need to be in the office, or they're like go home? Uh, well, I, I've I've been been able to be flexible and work from home, and mm -hmm. and and to be honest, I, just the way things have happened, I've done a little bit to do with my podcast as well. So yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't necessarily. It it was just more the fact of like I really didn't like the fact that there was there was just wasn't enough to be getting on with. I like to be busy. I like to to say have passion for what I do. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, go, totally on a trip, trip. go on a trip and work remotely. So <laughs> yes. now, now in my career, I work remotely 100%. Right. Sometimes I work, I go and work in-house with clients if they really need it or if we're doing a product launch or yeah. have, they have big budgets, then I will come there and I want to make sure that we're working together on products and stuff all the time. But, uh, but yeah, I work from about six to eight countries a year and I work remotely and I feel a lot more businesses are becoming open to that because they're yeah. seeing the efficiency, not just on the cost saving sides for them, which I'm much more affordable. I, I, um, 
than an in-house hire for marketing because you know you don't have to worry about my commuter benefits or yep. healthcare or whatever. Um, but also, I'm much more efficient on the work side. So you hire me, which I just signed a client two days ago, and we start on Monday yep. with. I've already been brought up to speed over the weekend. So this weekend I'm studying all their materials, looking over their campaigns yeah. and uh, we're starting on Monday with the kickoff call and starting executing right away. Whereas most people in house are going to first week, don't pressure yourself too much, relax a little yeah, bit, get to know yeah, the people yeah, on the yeah. team, go out for drinks, none of that here. So, so yeah. And, and, and that is defining quickly. a defining ch- a difference between a, a corporation versus a startup. A startup is from what I understand is, is more like deliver on what you've promised or what you, what you, what you need to your service or product that you, that you in, in the corporate world, it, it's, it's a bit slower. Let's say. Absolutely. And when I, and when I consult for corporations like match group in the U S $12 billion company, they own Tinder, plenty of fish, Okay, Cupid, Hinge. I consulted on the launch of, for six months of a new dating app and literally taught them how to move quick and be a startup and be okay breaking a few eggs to make an omelet. The yeah. most successful startups in the world are very reactionary, meaning they are focused on growth and reacting to anything that pops up, not preventing things from popping up. Yeah. Corporation, you're investing in legal and you have, and compliance and all these things because you're um, – preventing things from popping up because people come after you because you have a lot of money. So you need to be preventative. Whereas when you're a startup, nobody really cares about what you're doing. And you're, if you really make mistakes, the majority of the time, you're just going to get a cease and desist letter. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, they're going to be like, please stop doing this using our logo in your advertising. And you just stop and you're fine. And you go on, you go, okay. So the best startups are reactionary and uh, move fast and understand that, if you wait for something to be 100% correct or right, you'll be waiting forever. So you just got to get it to not going to really uh, get it to worthy of a test and then test it. So something I found over the last uh, probably three or four years working for a big corporation is that there's a lot of um, sort of startup entrepreneurial buzzwords, which which suddenly have been thrown around. And equally, um, there's been, there's a lot of talk um in my current company, which I'm leaving soon, is that they want to have labs or uh, sort of entrepreneurial teams which approach uh, situations, clients uh, in a complete, or sometimes internal as well. They approach their uh, those situations um, differently to a big corporation. Do you think, in your with your consultancy hat on, do you think that's actually viable? Is it actually possible to have the sort of startup ethos within a big corporation? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the companies that I work with, they're shifting towards teams. So, I mean, uh, and if they haven't gotten there, that's what I try to bring to the table. Basically, each team is so product, HR, advertising, whatever, those yeah. teams act like little startups in and of themselves. So 300, 500, or 1,000 person organization has teams of 10 to five to 50 yeah. people. And those teams act like startups or we try to inject that ethos. And then on the other side, marketing teams that hire me. So um, uh, like what I said, with, with companies that I hire, they normally have an incubator inside yeah. of the company. And that, yeah. that's like a 10 to 30 person organization that is a startup. They don't yeah. follow all the bureaucratic, slow moving red tape of the overall company. Their goal is to learn how to yeah. uh, behave like a startup. And I do think they can be successful. I think that um, um, they're still not moving as fast as a young, hungry startup because they're still in that corporate office and yeah. with those catered lunches and those big ca- comfy <laughs> couches. But um but I've seen some great things happen there, definitely. And that is really one of my biggest passions is finding those opportunities to work with companies like that and bring that value to them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could definitely see in, in, in my company the value of what we tend to do now in our business is sometimes outsource. So as I say, like they would, we would employ someone like you, your marketing company and sort of call me. <laughs> yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep your number on, on my phone. And if anything pops up, obviously I'll, I'll let you know what I love to do. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so so we've talked we've talked about your entrepreneurial spirit and your startup sort of mentality. Um, mm-hmm. 
but just what I, I think we have covered this, but I just wanted to sort of touch base about this this early stage because there's a lot of there's a lot of people that uh, that want to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and they want to start their own business. Right. And um, that's because they have a, a true passion for their product or service. Um, right. it, it, it's unique to my sort of sphere, the people that I mix with, that there's there's someone that is a sort of serial startup expert, which it sounds mm -hmm. like you are. And it sounds like you. So, so just give me a sort of um, a sort of an idea about this idea of this early stage startup rather than actually having your own startup it sounds like you actually yeah that's a good question that's a good question i mean technically my agency or my consulting firm is my startup but um the difference of being a startup marketing expert and focusing just on the marketing as a consultant is that i get to work on a ton of different projects from different industries that help different kinds of people and that have different problems and different solutions and different channels and different types of marketing. Um, whereas a founder of one company, so if I'd stayed with the company I founded 13 years ago, I'd have been just helping college students for the last 13 years working on one project. So um, would that have been big and worth millions of dollars by now? Who knows? But I'm not really focused on just the money. I like working on different things, solving challenging problems for different companies. And basically, helping people because a lot of the projects I work in they're to evolve industries and help people and create solutions for the end user. So I find that really fun and rewarding. And that's, that's why I've been doing it for 12 years. And it took me about 10 years to start saying the word expert and it still feels really <laughs> un, un, unnatural when I say it, but like if you say it and enough people say it, people hire me because they need an expert. Then I, then I have to live up to the part. And so the work is there. I've driven three, three companies from nothing to multi-million dollar exits as yeah. full-time full -time consultant. And I've launched maybe three dozen apps and projects and websites and tech brands around the world from um, Norway to Spain to Czech Republic, UAE, South Africa. I've uh, helped companies in Hong Kong. Uh, Taipei, Taiwan, all over. So mm -hmm. there's there's people doing these things all over and they don't all have access to like the tried and true growth tactics and strategies that we develop in San Francisco. Okay, just a, a sort of left field question just to keep you on your toes. How many languages do you speak? We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. That is an awesome question. So fluently, obviously English and then yeah. Spanish. Um, I'm conversationally in Arabic from five years based in the startup scene in Dubai. I speak pretty good Hindi. And then I can understand or say hello and how are you and maybe 10 more random ones like different African languages and stuff. Wow, that's brilliant. I, I, I'm i sinfully... Travel. Yeah, yeah. travel yeah. long enough. Yeah. Um, and, and do you find... Uh, do, do you... Do you learn? And one of the questions that often comes up in, in sort of things that I like talking about is about learning and, and how people, the different ways people learn. Sometimes it's reading, sometimes it's listening, sometimes it's immersion. Mm -hmm. How do you find the best way of learning a language? Immersion, 100%, or dating someone, which is immersion, <laughs> right? So yeah. you don't learn with your head, you learn with the heart, right? Yeah. So yeah. If, you can, if you can care about someone who only speaks that language, then you'll learn it much quicker. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. That's an interesting mm -hmm. perspective on that. I, 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 was, I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> I thought you were going to, because uh, I, I suppose in a sense it is immersion, isn't it? It's, 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 and as you say, if you care about the language and care about people in that country, you mm -hmm. will, you, you'll do that. That's, um, that's interesting. Um, so just to flick back onto uh, marketing. So you, you said you, you, you sort of built your knowledge 
working um, on, on startups and developing things for that. You, you don't have a you don't have a qualification in marketing. You've built that all up from your skills, knowledge, experience, and things like that. Um, yeah. What What advice could you give uh, a, a, an entrepreneur that's listening to this or watching this? And and what advice could you give them on marketing? Very general question, I know, but just very general question. I think the the best advice is to start by consulting for free or start for working for free. So if someone, I mean, like marketing is such a general thing and I don't even really consider myself a marketer. I'm more of a growth focused person. And the difference is marketing could be advertising or branding or, you know, the things you do in print and other like old school traditional um, promotions for your business events and whatever. And growth is all digital growth is more aggressive and focused on driving the business. Like, yeah. so I'm focused growth. Uh, here's the three things that drive the business. So sales, email and phone call meetings for the sales team. I'm focused on growing those three numbers with whatever activities that I'm doing. So um, I think the first thing to do is to just find a, what you're passionate about through testing. So, I think I'm passionate about shoes because I'm a little kid and I love my sneakers or whatever. Okay, so yeah. go find a shoe company and be like, I'll, I want to learn marketing. I'll do your marketing for free. I'm going to take some online courses like Andrew's course or whatever, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, yep. And, um, and I'm going to do marketing for you for free for three months. And if you like what I'm doing, you, maybe you can hire me. So like by investing your time to learn, you're getting, you're getting experience. And then that experience is then a, tradable commodity for your, your CV. So I think the, the number one thing is to figure out what you like yeah. and then do that all the time. So if you can figure out what you're really passionate about, whether it's marketing or traveling or writing or whatever it is, then you can do it really well eventually because you can put it in the time easily and get good at it. So for me, when I started out in marketing, I think it takes, like I said, being open to really any opportunity like this opportunity in Mexico. And then it takes a little bit of luck, someone that believes in you before you have that experience. So I told that tourism company in Mexico that I was going to learn these things and do that. And I didn't work for free, but I worked for really, really cheap just because I, I knew I was going to be passionate about what they were doing. Um, and I knew I was going to be able to invest that time to get good at what they needed done. And so they took a risk on me and they, they invested in me quite a bit. Like they bought me books, training, and gave me a budget for a while. And I put in more time than anybody at the company and quickly shot up the ranks. And we built the business very quickly because of that shared, shared risk that we took together. So, so, so one of the things that's just popped into my mind is the idea of uh, you, you. We mentioned like you, uh, you're not slightly uncomfortable with the word expert, but it's it's the ten thousand hours, isn't it? You've got to be able to do your ten thousand hours to be able to be good at something. There's like a lot of people, uh, especially younger people who are, want to be an entrepreneurs, are fleeting between an idea for a couple of months and something tails off and they try something else and they try something else. And I, I actually think that's a valued uh, process for, for school leavers or, or, or college leavers or degree leavers. Um, but I do think we, you, to be considered an expert, as I, I would say you are an expert, I, I, it, it's just, it's mainly, I think you need to put the effort in, you have to put the time in, you have to put the dedication in. And there are no shortcuts to these 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 situations you have to put in the hours to be successful um years well, yes yeah exactly measure, so you said 12 years year. isn't it yeah, yeah. and uh, countless countless projects and with each project you learn you know that this is something we say in startups there's no such thing as failure there's only winning and learning and the more times you do you either win or learn and yeah. what not to do and so yeah. the more times you do, you get closer and closer to winning because you're like, don't do this, don't do that, do this. Yeah. And after 12 years, literally one of the biggest value that I add to new companies is you haven't made these mistakes yet. I have. So let me work with you so that you don't make these mistakes. I can save you the hassle from making those mistakes. So I definitely agree. It's a lot of time. And, and do you do you, do you believe I believe is probably the wrong word, but do you do you believe in sort of personal development, self-development as a as a human? Because um, uh, it, it sounds like you, you've immersed yourself in 
re in countries you've immersed yourself in in marketing um but do you uh i, I just wonder is like do you think it's uh it's it's critical to, to to specify very quickly or do you think you should remain a sort of generalist that is flexible in the in the business market space interesting point or interesting question i think if you're a job seeker and you're at the early stage of your career you should stay generalized but as you get more and more experience and you remain passionate about this one thing then you should you should um specialize so it's you know if you try to market to everyone, you market to no one. Yeah. So you, you definitely want to know who your target is. Um, but if you're, st you're still at that testing phase in your career where you want to try new things, then you should stay generalized. I think definitely. Yeah. So just on that. So I, I, I believe, um, the, the, the skill set which takes you in business is to is in a way to be remain a, a, a generalist because you need to be able to turn your hand to marketing to sales to uh, uh, research and development or, or whatever it, that that is because for me in my corporate world I, I need to be a, a jack of all trades I need to know a little bit of everything you as a consultant you're marketing yourself on 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 your specialism on your knowledge and your experience that you can bring to the party um for for, for a very selfish point of view so so would you say in a in a corporation so you've worked in corporations or, or been involved in corporations should should you specialize in 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 a, in a big corporation as well just sort of sounding you off on that yeah, yeah. Again, it depends on how long, far away you are, or how far along you are in your career. If you're, yeah. um, if you're specialized at an early stage, that's fine. But if you want to grow in a corporation, you need to have like managerial experience, and you need to be more of a generalist if you want to make yeah. it to those director and and yeah. C level roles, which I never want to do. I mean, director obviously is a marketing director for maybe three to four different companies in my career. Um, it had staff underneath me and set the marketing strategy and managed with their time and optimized what the team as a whole is doing. Um, and you're not going to get th to that level if you're just specialized. So for me now as a consultant, I try to be a jack of all trades, but specialized on the target that I'm focusing on. So right. marketing wise, I know every, I'm fluent in every marketing channel. I optimize search and content and social and uh, dev many different channels for, um, clients that I work with usually all at the same time. So I, I don't try to just do one thing for a client. So if someone comes to me, Andrew, we want you to manage our Facebook ads and that's it. I'm, I'm not interested. I want to only work with a small subset of clients that I do everything for. So the one stop marketing shop. Um, that's really interesting because, because um, for this podcast, I'm, I'm trying different techniques on marketing and, and we touched before we came um, on, on online that, um, that the, the, there's there's opportunities there and, and and as a one man band it's just me doing this um i'm sort of t testing experimenting with instagram adverts with yeah. facebook responding to groups in facebook social media advertising and i must admit it, it, it it's a really interesting point you make because for me i can only i only have so many hours in the day after a full-time right. job as well so I have to experiment in my marketing campaigns or marketing of, of the podcast. Um, but you said you would, you, in your sort of immersiveness of, of, of the way you learn and, and, and teach and develop people, you would say you would, if you, if you took over my sort of podcast idea and you were like, well, I would do Facebook, I would do Instagram, I would do Twitter, I would do uh, LinkedIn, I would do email advertising i would do banner advertising would you just if would you just uh sort of get me up to speed and say actually to be successful you need to cover all these bases rather than what you're doing which is just test tweak change test tweak change yeah i think that a good marketing strategy has three main components the first component is the strategies that i know will work based on 12 years of experience so for a content for paid content marketing. I know that there's these, these, and these strategies um, that'll work for developing or building your user base. Um, then the second part is the strategies that you have already tested that are your data shows that are working. So I take those over with a full-time focus 
and scale those strategies up. And then the third part are the industry specific things that after I do research, I find are really valuable. For instance, like Spreaker is a, is a podcast community. So I wouldn't know about that beforehand, but maybe we're going to do a test on Spreaker.com and see if um, that's a really good, valuable um, user acquisition channel. So we put knowing those three things, you, you, I basically I create a menu or these are all the total marketing and growth ideas for Mark's yeah. podcast. And um, we work together to develop a strategy. So like usually in three month increments based on um, budgetary constraints, product constraints, operational constraints. So we don't want to grow ex too much because we're not ready because we don't have 20 podcasts lined up in the product. Hmm. So um, let's just try these lower budget, smaller, lower hanging fruit options. And we'll get to that paid advertising yeah. later on. So that's kind of how I approach it, but it all starts with research and working with the team and the client to go over um, what their goals are, what their constraints are and develop that strategy. And it also starts with looking at the product on developing from a marketing point of view, like is Mark mentioning at the beginning and the end to tell people to follow him? Is he, making sure that um, people that he's uh, interviewing are sharing the product uh, or the, the, the podcast. So optimizing the product first for marketing is usually yeah. optimized. Yeah. For marketing um, opportunities is yeah. where we start. And then we start testing and launching those new campaigns after that. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, so tell me, so we've, we've talked quite a lot about marketing and uh, consultancy and where your expert lies. So your, your, your company and your startups, as we can see on your T-shirt, um, what what is it? What what what's your? What, if yeah. you were trying to sell sell to me what Andrew Startups does, what would you say? Sure. So it's a one man show. I have a, uh, it's a startup consulting agency, but it's really just me. So um, when I became a consultant, I branded myself as Andrew Startups because when like everyone in my network is like, whenever I think of startups, I think of you. And I was like, let me see if Andrew startups is available. And yeah. as a search engine optimization expert um, and someone who's done multi-million dollar search campaigns for businesses, 10 different countries, I realized that uh, if I can get my name and what I am passionate about as a URL, then it'll be really easy for people to find me even on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook.com, yeah. my email address, you can guess it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's for owning that search engine um, r results page for anything. So if you search Andrew and startups, you're only going to see me, especially if it's one word. Right. But um, what it is, is um, I realized that instead of working full time for long term for three to five years per project, I could consult for three to six months per project, usually one project at a time. And I'm consulting for a pretty high rate, but I'm able to do everything for that country company. Um, and really, really help them achieve massive growth in the first six months of their marketing because I move faster and independently than uh, anyone that they could find. And then um, they can take that time savings and invest that into building their actual internal team. And I help with that also. So helping them create the job listings for marketing directors, set the goals for what they need that person to have. Um, and then even interviewing those people and then getting them on board and handing everything off in those six months. So that's kind of what Andrew startups does. So let's say this podcast took off for you. Hope, hope, hope yeah. so. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden you turn it into a million dollar merchandising business and you're getting, you know, sponsorships like Joe Rogan's podcast where he's getting, you know, $600,000 uh, amino acid protein bars yeah, yeah, and whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, you, know, you now have a marketing budget and instead of testing things yourself in your spare time, you, you bring me on board and I write a strategy and I implement those things according to that strategy. And at the end of that six months, we know these five channels are what, what are working. This is the ROI. This is the LTV of a new listener. And this is how we're acquiring them. We have B2B stuff going as well. That's acquiring new brands into the sales team. Um, and you have a marketer in place that I've hired and trained and they're, they're maybe more cost effective than me, but they would never have been able to build out those strategies on their own. So I help people like get a more junior marketer and then train them with all the yeah. experience that I have to then yeah. execute after I leave. So I pay for myself over time for companies um, yeah. for the long run and they get access to someone that they wouldn't be able to get because I'm not joining a lot of, I, w I wouldn't be open to joining a lot of these projects um, 
otherwise. So they get access to me for a much more affordable rate. And so that's what Andrew Startups is. Um, yeah, that's the whole pitch. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so leading on from that, you, you, you've got an online course, which you're uh, yeah. starting bootstrap. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So, so um, three years of consulting, I've had a lot of success. Some companies have raised millions of dollars off my campaigns. Companies have had app launches where they've got 50,000 downloads with no spend in the first month. Um, and what that means is I'm able to charge more and more as a consultant because I'm creating millions of dollars worth of revenue for these companies. So charging ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month isn't crazy for these businesses. But for early stage startups, like at the phase that you're at now, you're still in product development. You need to grow. You don't yeah. have a huge marketing budget. I uh, used to always have to be like, you know, politely decline. I'm not, you're not. You're not. A, you're not at the stage where I'm ready to help you. So I was saying no to about 95% of the inbound traffic I was getting. And last year when I was working on developing a new app or releasing and launching a new app for Tinder and Match Group in LA, um, I was making a ton of money and I wanted to invest in um, helping those companies that can't afford to hire me as a consultant. So I spent six months uh, developing an online course, which I don't like the term online course, but let's say um, online class, online program, whatever it is, yeah. it's 45 HD videos and a 60 page interactive workbook that has templates, cheat sheets, strategies, tool recommendations, examples um, from my career that teach these uh, early stage entrepreneurs how to do influencer marketing, how to do search engine optimization for their website, how to do PR for their own business without hiring an agency, how to do content marketing and build a blog, how to do um, email marketing and write B2B emails that will convert. Um, and the list goes on. It's about 10 different channels that I teach them how to hack without any additional spend. So viral online sweeps, how to do giveaways that get tens of thousands of entrants without any spend. So that course starts at $997 and they get access to like 75% uh, of the videos. Then it goes up to $1,500 and they get all the videos all learn on your own. And then at the highest end, it's the signature package is $2,500. And I actually audit that client's business, that student's business. I give them a strategy, just like I was talking about, like I do for real clients. Um, I sit with them for two hours. So one hour at the beginning, of course, one hour at the end of the course to go over their marketing, give them uh, suggestions on what to focus on in the course in the beginning and at the end, what to focus on afterwards. Sometimes we review the campaigns that they've created and the marketing that they've started. And the return on investment is huge. I've gotten about 15 students through this year. The program takes a couple months to watch all the videos and implement everything. They have unlimited access for life and they can share it with anyone on their team. So it's not like one license per employee. Um, I do monthly payments for people. I give discounts for uh, found area. You know, I'm here in South Africa right now. I give 25% off to founders in South Africa because the currency is a little bit you know, d deflated here. And so I really, the goal is to be able to help people around the world build their businesses um, and be able to give them access to these things that I've, these strategies that I've developed in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley, working at the cutting edge of technology and the cutting edge of marketing and growth hacking, um, stuff that they're never going to learn anywhere else. So um, it's, another another thing is if they don't even have the budget to get on that program, I also offer by the hour consulting, which is what I think we're going to do. I'm going to offer to you after this, like you might be a little bit early for the course. Mm. You need to get some more episodes, like yeah. get up to 10 episodes and then really start blasting it out there once the product yeah. is ready. Um, but we could spend an hour a month going over the marketing and what you're doing and giving you good, really good ideas and strategies and um, tests to focus on. So people, people like that own nurseries, insurance companies, mm all kinds of non-startup businesses book hours with me like set hours uh, like yeah. five hours a month to just chat with their marketing team and continue to push them to be more aggressive and more fast and more nimble and more startup focused. and this is all digital stuff you, you you're it's, it's, you, you don't digital. do more tradition you don't do the traditional side no or... i think i think that um for an early stage business you should never be focusing on anything that isn't offline um, okay. even if you're an offline restaurant or whatever, you should be focusing on all digital in the beginning because the ROI is so present. It's trackable. It's quantitative. 
Yeah. You can actually see what's happening and you should get to outdoor advertising or radio or anything like that when you're a later stage business. And, After, and, and equally on that, do you, so, so you said about the return on investment is, is better for, for sort of social media or, or online advert, advertising and marketing. Um, what, is, what is the best advertising or marketing platform in the social media? At for social media now? Well, Facebook is the biggest online advertising tool in the world. Um, I'd say 84% of, of every dollar, 84 cents out of every dollar spent on digital advertising right now is in the Facebook ecosystem. So Instagram, Facebook, or WhatsApp, or um, uh, maybe other smaller brands that they own. Um, but there is no one awesome tool over across the board, right? It depends on your target demographic, your budget, and your product, right? So whatever you're trying to sell, who you're trying to sell it to, and how much you can spend to sell it is basically how I approach developing that what, what, what strategies and channels we want to test yeah. but then beyond that it's a test and no matter what after 12 years i'm still surprised like 25 percent of the time which which channels work best for which company it's interesting because um so as i said i've done a little bit of instagram advertising or, or promotions and um mm -hmm. They give you some demographics and details very quickly of the people that are actually clicking on your uh, right. your, your your promotion. Um, so so for a so they gave me um, uh, basically it was between twenty one and thirty or eighteen yeah, and thirty one something that was my demographic. Mm -hmm. Now what do I do with that apart from knowing that most of the people that are going to listen to my podcast are probably graduates probably right. early early in a corporation early in a mm -hmm. business or a startup what what do I, I i've got that information that's that's great now what do i do with it this is what i think we we, yeah. we often which hopefully you can sort of add value is that we get this data and 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 a lot of the stuff that people um uh sort of provide you is oh i can do this dashboard for you i can show you this i can show mm -hmm. you that but actually what you really need is the insight behind that that demographic data right. so what would you say yeah. um 21 to 31 or whatever that dem demographic is so what, 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 what would i do with that information right so what you would do with that is you would basically scale up with paid advertising that the focus on that demographic. So if you see the best engagement is 21 to 30, then you know that when you have a budget to do paid ad, and that's through your organic promotions, I think you're talking about, yeah. you basically know to cater your advertising to that when you're spending money. So you've spent time driving organic traffic. You're seeing that the best engagement's coming from that target. Then when you are doing inorganic or paid advertising, you want to focus on that target. So that's the data that I'm using to inform the, decisions I'm making as a paid user acquisition expert. Okay. Awesome. Um, so what, what's the next project? It sounds like you've got plenty going on as a consultancy business online, yeah. online programs, let's call it. Um, what, what's the, what's the, have you got a, 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 the, the next big thing? Yeah. So the main focus right now is trying to help as many startups as possible. Um, which I've never focused on before. Like last year, I was only able to consult with four clients all year because of my rate, because of where they need to be in their business, the budgets they need to have. So this year, I'm trying to help as many people as possible with the hourly consulting. So anybody, even at the idea stage that's listening to this, that wants to book an hour with an expert, um, Mark will share the links. You can book an hour time with me. We can talk about your idea, your market, your product, what, the solution that you're creating. Um, and then if they are already at a stage where they need to grow the business, the course is a great option for them. So I'm chatting with people, um, offering 20 minute free chat with people to see if they want to book the, uh, or to enroll in the course and the program. And then beyond that, I'm doing, um, free online webinars on um, Instagram, teaching people how to do growth hacking there. And, um, yes, yeah, so I'm just trying to help as many people possible this year yeah and, and and do obviously drop me the the links and things like that and i'll put it in the show notes and we can talk about that just so so everyone if they if they do want to book some time with you or get on your course then um then obviously they can do that uh, there mm -hmm. um so so I'm, I'm just gonna i'm gonna jump around a little bit because um just so 
so we we spoke earlier about your three successful multi-million dollar startup exits that you use mm -hmm. i just want to slightly touch base on that and sort of yeah. understand um the scale because i think this is one of the things if there's people in here that are, have actually got businesses and the biggest challenge is as a one-man band you can do so much but actually to to get to have employees or actually scale to a larger size how would you suggest for if anyone's listening that's in that position how to scale up a business fast well it should never be i mean the goal should be to help people and create value and if your startup or your business is doing that at scale then um, then you need to grow but you never just want to grow for no reason it should be based on the data and um, so if the business is growing and you're, you're providing a solution that people like and the product is working and the marketing is working, then it's time to grow. And um, the first thing to do is make sure that the marketing will sustain that and that it's at a ROI positive um, result. So I'm spending ten dollars, I'm getting 15 or whatever it is. And then, um, you know, make sure that you have those growth plans in place. But I think a lot of the areas where companies run into problems if they are growing super fast is on the team and culture fits. Yeah. So hiring internally can take lots of time. And that's why I think consultants are such a good idea. So if you have a startup and you're listening to this and you're, you're already growing a lot, you should look, work with the growth agency because um, taking time to hire someone internally can slow down those growth plans and can cause um, a lot of growing pains internally if you're a small team and someone doesn't like each other and then someone leaves and it's a costly um, mistake to make so that's one thing um, but but beyond that it's really all about making sure that you have enough funding and that you have um, the right founder in place that can weather that storm because it's stressful to grow quickly it's long hours to make sure that you're taking care of those users mm -hmm. and you need to be focused on the right thing and you, if it's an early if it's a first time founder and the, they've been in the trenches for years, not making any money. And they get to a point where they start to grow and be successful. A lot of times they start spending money and getting really overexcited and relaxing, going on vacation after three years of no vacation. And so that, that is a red flag. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're working with a founder um, that is still going to see the course and put in the time to get to where they need to get. Um, for me, I drove three quick exits in six years, all three exits as a head of marketing. So I was the first marketing hire at these companies, wasn't a co-founder. They had already worked on developing the product, been in that stressful, we have no idea if we're ever going to make money situation. They start to make a little bit of money. Then they hire me and I scale it way up and we exit the company within a year of me joining at each company pretty much. Um, and uh, so I love those stressful situations but then again i also know that i can handle the marketing part i'm not going to be in the funding situations and the hiring of hr and operations people so anything related to marketing and growth i love it i'm passionate about it. i can put in 24 hours in a day into doing it sleep maybe 30 minutes or something no i'm <laughs> kidding um and uh but the other things you need somebody else to handle that that's yeah, better, yeah. smarter than you so, so funding wise, so obviously at, at that time, your company, the companies you work for are looking for seed funding, whether venture capital funding, um, this might not be, be your complete area of expertise, but what, what advice have you seen for people to get funded? Because a lot of people um, now see, um, I'll give up 5% of my business to, to, to get uh, to get something or get a, a, an extra injection of money and I, I, I also think that organic growth is actually very very good as well um, but if, if people were looking for funding um, what advice would you give them on how to attain that and, and maybe not give up too much of your equity in your business yeah, I think the first depends on what stage you're at. So if you if you're at the idea stage, you go and you look for an incubator. There's idea right. incubators yeah. that will take your idea. They believe in you as a person, as a business person and a founder. They'll invest twenty to fifty thousand dollars on your idea, um, and uh, you basically they give you that money to develop your minimally viable product, your MVP. Yeah. And then after that you stage. You, you would go and you'd launch and you'd get some initial traffic and then you would raise a seed round, which a, uh, a seed, seed round or angel investors or um, you know, uh, maybe that incubator wants to then reinvest with more money now that you've made it past that idea stage to the MVP stage and you've got some good data. 
Um, at that stage, you give up a little bit more for a lot more money, like usually two to five hundred thousand um, dollars, or one to five hundred thousand dollars. And um, at that stage, they usually hire a marketing agency, like my, because it's not enough money to do a long-term hire yeah. as a market a marketing director. You can get an intern, and that's about it. But they're not going to know how to do anything. So they reach out to an agency like mine. We then scale the growth way up, and then they go and raise. If, if we're all successful and the product works, I know I'll be successful because I've been doing it for so long. I know it will hit, but we need some marketing budgets for those targets. And um, that's the sweet spot. That's usually where I hit. And then um, we hit the numbers that they need and they go and raise five to $20 million after that. And that's when they build out an entire team yeah. um, and they just go to the billion dollar valuation after that. So I've worked with lots of companies in that area. Um, the way to go about fundraising is to figure out the, the VCs or the venture capitalists that are interested in things that you're doing. So your industry, where you're headquartered. So if you're a, Den, a Danish startup in Copenhagen, then go look for VCs there because they're looking for projects based there. You know, you have way less competition than looking in San Francisco. The reason why so many people move to Silicon Valley after their business takes off it's because the VCs are a lot more than money there. The VCs there have tons of connections because they've been in the industry where people are driving the industry forwards and yeah. they have all the connections to the people who with the best talent and the best um, access in, to technology in the world. And so you get a VC in San Francisco, not just for the money, but because they've won many times before, like myself, yeah. um, I've been through this countless times so getting me involved in your business as a consultant is more than just marketing it's my experience and my expertise and that's the same with venture capital so if you go out and you look for investment you might want to look over someone who only has money if they don't have the experience in the industry i've definitely worked in projects where the lead investor was from like the construction industry and the projects and travel and they're not able to add any value yet they invested and so you have to have them in core meetings and yeah. they actually drive you in the wrong direction I had a client in Czech Republic that was invested from a billionaire landowner in Germany and he was in meetings and making bad design suggestions and things like that. And it eventually killed the project um, because this, the founders and the investors were all people that should not have been in on these key meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so I, I believe, and I, I talk about that business is a people, often a people business. And, and, and a lot of the, the stuff that I do is about building relationships, building rapport with people, making mm -hmm. sure um, that, that, I, that they're getting some a value, that I'm getting value all, all equally. Um, so all these people that you work with, uh, like early stages and maybe in your consultancy business as well, do you actually have to like the people you work with? It sounds, it sounds a weird question, but I just wonder, like, if, if you have to go to, and work for a startup, right. you've got to have yeah. rapport with those so, people, haven't you? So two things. So I think it's more important to be passionate about the project right. than the people you're working with at a startup. But if you are in-house and you are the first marketing hire at a 10-person company or a five-person company, you better get along with those people because yeah, you're going to yeah. be working endlessly. And you need to make any. Any, um, there's a lot of data out there that emotional intelligence is more important than uh, IQ in a yeah. work environment because yeah. you need to be able to maintain those relationships and rely on people for different projects. So part of what I do as a consultant for these big corporations is work cross-departmentally with a lot of different people in the corporation from, from HR to product to marketing um, to uh, engineering and tech and all kinds of different things. And, um, yeah, so you do, I just, I feel like in general, you want to be a likable person and you need yeah. to get along, but as a consultant, it's less important that you really love the people and more important that you love the project and that you're able to put the hours in. Okay. But full time. You better get along. With you better them. get on with them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so we, we touched on it earlier. So it's your, your business businesses are, are just, a one-man band it's just you. you you don't employ vas or you don't employ admin assistants or uh, anyone no i am um i have had i had an assistant for half of this year it depends i go on a project basis so if i take on a really big client that's going to take up all my time then i'm going to need an assistant to do my social media and answer my emails and take inbound leads for for other um, work and for discussing the course with people and stuff. So um, right now I'm a one man, one man show, 
but I definitely lean on other experts around the world for campaigns that I'm not an expert in. So I consider myself a jack of all trades, but I'm definitely more focused on the B2C projects and a lot of um, search and paid user acquisition and influencer marketing and content. And then for other things like email lead gen and SaaS campaigns, when clients in the B2B space come in, I lean on other experts. Um, if it's a larger content project that I don't have the time for, I lean on a content marketing and content creation expert that I work with. So I have experts that I work with around the world. And actually, I'm, I'm launching, I'll just say it here, I'm launching a, my own agency. So Andrew Startups is more about my personal brand than just me. But yeah. to be able to really work with the big boys and the big startups that are really scaling up, I have to employ these other experts as well. And so I have growthexperts.com with a Z. So I'll be launching that later this year where we'll be a full-fledged awesome. digital agency, but all experts, no outsourcing, all in-house. We work right. with the team. And so, so, um, so, so yeah, so I'm a one man show right now because I'm only working on one project at a time right now. I'm working with a startup called Matt's flights. Um, they're flight deal aggregator. Um, and, uh, I'm doing all their paid advertising and their search and their giveaway com- promotions. I have a couple other smaller clients. And then the main goal for me is trying to promote the course to the startup founders that don't have access to them, to yeah. the budgets, to hire me as a consultant. So that's my number one thing right now. Awesome. So let's wrap this up. Um, I, I, You've been really fascinating insight into marketing and, and, and global moving and lots of different areas that we've covered here. Um, where can people find you, Andrew? So I'm online everywhere at Andrew Startups. So twitter.com slash Andrew Startups, Instagram.com slash, or yeah, slash Andrew Startups, andrewstartups.com. You can email me at hello at andrewstartups.com. Um, uh, the number one thing I want to tell people about is the course. I feel like if your your audience is more centered around people at the idea stage or the early stage, they probably haven't raised money yet for their business or they're not, they don't have a huge marketing budget. So that's great for booking hours with me. So if you are running any campaigns or you want to see if your business could benefit from running any paid campaigns or you want me to help set up, I'm setting up paid advertising for an auto body shop in Thailand. This weekend, three hours of work for me, just three hours of work for me versus weeks for them trying to figure this stuff out. So um, I do help smaller businesses that aren't even startups. So if you're not a startup and you're just an entrepreneur, you can book an hour with me um, at andrewstartups.as.me or just go to my Instagram and click book um, or go to my website and click book as well. But um, yeah, so that's that's the lowest level. Then the course is... um, available on the website or on my social media as well and if you are if you are at a stage where your product is ready and you need to grow your business but you don't have money to spend on growing the business this is everything else but paid ads this will teach you how to do everything else but paid ads so right. you can build that traction to then having money to go spend on the paid advertising afterwards which nobody no marketing agency tells you that you can do yourself yeah. you can do yourself i will teach you how um, and all you have to do is enroll in that course. Awesome. Awesome, Andrew. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it sounds like you're an incredibly busy person, so thank you for finding the time to come on my podcast. Um, that's fantastic. Should, uh, well, let's leave it there, um, and um, let, let's catch up soon. Awesome. Thank you very Cheers, much. Cheers. Bye.